Welcome to Bay St. Louis, a small town on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. This town has many things that make it a great place to live. It has beautiful beaches and community parks, local businesses, government buildings, a highly academic performing school system, community centers, public theaters, a train depot, churches, a newly constructed marina, an iconic bridge, and even its own sign. But many don't know that this small town also has a big history. It's important that we study our past so that we don't repeat our mistakes in the future. History is what makes us who we are today. Without it, we wouldn't know who we are. History is like a key that locks the door to the vast and unknown world that is buried in our own backyards. But it's also a giant blinking sign that tells us to learn for our blunders, protect our world for future generations, and that senseless violence is like a blind and ignorant scream into the void. On these shores, on December 13, 1814, the USS Seahorse and two cannons on land fought off seven British longboats that were trying to confiscate supplies and ammunition from the depot that was down the street. Though not significant battles, the Battle of the Bay of St. Louis and the Battle of Lake Bourne the following day, December 14th, what they did was they allowed General Andrew Jackson to prepare for those British troops as they were coming towards New Orleans. As the cannons fired from the shore, an American serviceman climbed up an oak tree, possibly this oak tree, to give a better view to the cannoneers on where to hone in their shots as the British longboats came into the shore of Bay St. Louis. There was an article that appeared in the New Orleans Quarterly from the historic New Orleans collection that uh, made reference to a letter that a woman had written to a friend of hers, and in this letter she makes reference to this Mrs. Claiborne who was visiting in Bay St. Louis, and so she, we have the, the credence, the truthfulness there to verify this legend that has been told. And what actually occurred is that as the uh, British ships were in Lake Bourne, which historically extends to the mouth of the Bay of St. Louis, uh, as these ships, the warships, were passing, headed toward New Orleans, uh, one of them came up into the bay uh, because there was the idea, idea that there were some munitions stored here. The people on the bay, the officers who were in charge, had been told to sink or be sunk. In other words, to sink any ships that came in or boats that came in, or to sink the uh, munitions that they had there. So, as they were standing there, and people in town were out, not partying, but they were out looking to see what was going on, to find out what was going on, what all the commotion was. And as they were standing there, this elderly woman, a Mrs. Claiborne, is said to have made the comment, will no one fire a shot in defense of our country? And or in defense of our city, and one of the young gentlemen there, a man named John Toulmay, John B. Toulmay, who later became mayor of Bay St. Louis, took uh, a, either a cigar or a cigarette and lighted the cannon, and that shot fired made the British who were coming in think that there were more men stationed here and more munitions stationed here, so they turned to leave. Now. The uh, Americans who were, who were stationed here did sink their boat that contained the munitions. But, as I said, for years we've always heard that legend, but we had nothing to substantiate it until this letter surfaced and was in the, uh, the New Orleans Quarterly. As legend has it, as the British ships were approaching the shore, a crowd was gathering, and an elderly woman from that crowd, Miss Claiborne, who was visiting from Natchez, who was also on crutches, came over to where the cannons were and said, who will take a shot in defense for my country? Then she took a lit cigar from the mayor, lit the first cannon. It may have even been this cannon right here. Oh my God. 
gosh. People ask why the past matters. The past matters because without the past, we don't know how to not mess up in the future. Because if we know not to mess up as a future, we can grow as an economy, as in a country, and become one with society. Another interesting tidbit about the War of 1812 is the Star Spangled Banner. The Star Spangled Banner was invented by Francis Scott Key. The British bombarded um, Fort McHenry on the night of September 13, 1814. That's when Francis Scott Key went outside and he still saw the flag hanging above. I'm proud to be American because we accept all different kinds of people and we're not ignorant to like different groups and we're always fighting for different rights for different people. Here we are at the famous pirate house property. It is rumored here that the pirate Jean Lafitte may have had some sort of connection, but we do know for sure is that Jean Lafitte assisted defeating the British at the Battle of New Orleans. But going back to what we know about the pirate house, it was built somewhere around 1800, 1803. Um, we know from a legend, well, we don't know this, let me backtrack. We don't know for sure, but we have a legend that it was built by a man who was considered the overlord of the pirates and who was instrumental in getting the Lafitte's to be helpful in the Battle of New Orleans, which they were. And at first, their, their overture to be helpful was thrown out. Jackson called him those hellish banditti or something like that, and Claiborne, W.C.C. Claiborne was not in favor of it. They were against accepting uh, Lafitte and his pirates. It was a good offer. It was a genuine offer by both Lafitte, Jean Lafitte, and by his brother, um, who was in jail for a while. They got him out of jail. These people felt it was their commitment to this area. They had made lots of money here. They were accepted by the popular, I say here, I mean in the New Orleans area primarily. They were accepted when they would bring some contraband goods in, the high level citizenry of New Orleans would flock to the area to buy the, the, uh, the, the uh, silks and whatever they had to, to offer. So they did want to assist and as a matter of fact they did. Now Lafitte himself, Jean Lafitte himself did not um, he was not part of the battle, but he, what he was doing at the time of the battle was gathering up flints, and which the armies had very, very little of. And if it hadn't been for more flints that they, the Lafitte's had stored, it would have been a rough, a rough go. Mm. Um, but his men, including his brother and including two of his captains, one of whom was named Dominic Yu, um, the other, I'm forgetting his name right now, but they were both real fine cannoneers. And they assisted greatly in the, in the battle. But after the battle, um, because of insult and some just for just uh, by way of sake, I mean, for, for the sake of just getting back to piracy, they went back to piracy, okay. including Jean Lafitte. Why do you like studying history? I like studying history because knowing what our country did to get to where we are just makes you think of how much you love where we are and how free we are all, all the more. Americans were very outnumbered during the Battle of New Orleans and they still won. Three major events that happened in the War of 1812, this is what most people know about, the burning of the White House and the Capitol. Francis Scott Key writing the Star Spangled Banner, and Old Hickory, Andrew Jackson, and his victory at the Battle of New Orleans. Yeah, the Villarys were a very important family. They owned one of the major plantations in St. Bernard Parish, and it bordered um, Bayou B Avenue. That's where the British came in. Yep. When the British came along this coast, they went through 
Um, well, Eddie told you part of that story. They went through Lake Barn and then um, on their way to uh, uh, Pea Island, where they stopped and ferried their people in small boats all the way to what is now St. Bernard Parish, and they entered Bayou B Avenue. The first encounter they made um, was with the Villery family at their plantation, and they imprisoned those, those the family, the, including Colonel Villery and his two sons. One of those sons escaped, and um, a dog followed him. And the young man climbed a tree. The dog stayed under the tree, and he was afraid the dog would give him away. So he came down and killed his dog. It's a very poignant story. Hmm. And then he made his way to Jackson and warned Jackson, the British warned their way hmm. in. Yeah, the, the, the father, Colonel Villery, <clears throat> and all of them really were active then in the, the defense of New Orleans. And, um, and that Villery was the first elected uh, native born um, governor of Louisiana. He succeeded W.C.C. Claiborne. I thought it would be fun to share the story of my great, 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 great grandfather, Juan Cuevas, and the role he played in the Battle of New Orleans. As many stories go, the Juan Cuevas story has been passed down in my family through oral history. Many historians have documented this story, and this, my story is a blend of both. My great-grandmother, Rosalie Angelina Cuevas Winter, told me that Juan was born in Spain on the Mediterranean Sea. This was in the late 1700s. As a young man, he got into trouble with the Spanish king for a smuggling issue. His family pleaded to the queen and had his punished lesson to banishment. He was sent to America and ended up on the Mississippi coast after some time spent in Florida. He met and married a young girl named Mary Marie Helen Ladner. Her father was Nicholas Christian Ladner, after which Past Christian is named. Nicholas Ladner had the job of lighthouse keeper of Cat Island and lived there with his family. As time went on, Juan became the lighthouse keeper. He established a working farm with cattle, gardens for food and herbs, and a homestead near the water. In the year 1814, the British invaded the Barrier Islands in search of someone to guide them through the marsh to attack New Orleans. Juan Cuevas was captured by the British and suffered an injury to his leg from a musket ball. He was intimidated and imprisoned on one of their ships. Beaten and tortured by the British, Juan refused to aid them through the marsh. He told the English that although he was Spanish, he was American by choice and had found a happy refuge and home in his country. He declared that he preferred to be a lighthouse keeper for the American government rather to, than to trust the promises given by the British. The forces departed in hopes of finding their own way to New Orleans. Cuevas fled after their departure and although injured from his wounds, used a hidden rowboat to reach the Rigolees at English Lookout, as it was then called. Cuevas gave the Americans at the lookout the message that was quickly relayed to officials in New Orleans. The American forces were given information from Cuevas on the size of the British warships, their approximate strength, and the time of arrival to New Orleans. This information allowed the Americans to make better preparations for the invasion, which allowed a huge defense. This act of bravery from Juan Cuevas stop, undoubtedly stopped the British from attacking New Orleans before it was ready and led to a British defeat. Because of his create, courageous acts, the United States government presented Juan Cuevas with the whole of Cat Island. He also received a letter of thanks from General Jackson himself. Although his good deed failed to make major history books, it has never been forgotten on the Mississippi coast and never by his many descendants. Why do we study history? We study history so we will know what our past because that's really important so we don't repeat our mistakes because a lot of things, if you don't learn your history, you won't realize like you're just repeating exactly what someone else did. So it would be better, a better way to do something instead of doing the exact same thing wasting your time.
The home of Andrew Jackson Jr., the adopted son of President Andrew Jackson, was located here. Jackson Jr. and his wife Sarah named this property the Seasong Plantation. They lived here just before the Civil War until they sold it in 1861. And the most interesting thing about Seasong is not on that marker. We just didn't have the room to put it on. But uh, the, the wife of Andrew Jackson Jr had served for a little while as first lady in the White House. I think that's a fascinating thing, that here in Waveland, we had the first lady of the White House. Mm -hmm. And she only served for a short time. You, you all may know that Jackson's wife, the, the president's wife, um, who was Rachel, R Rachel died um, before Jackson was inaugurated after he was elected, but before he was inaugurated. But Rachel had been childless. Rachel's brother and his wife had twins. And one of the stories is, and we don't have any hard evidence of this either, but there's one story that indicates that the mother of those twins was sickly and couldn't raise two, two children. And so Jackson and, and, and uh, Rachel took that child and, uh, and raised him as their own. As you have been watching and learning about our small city, Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, I hope that you contemplate the amazing amount of history that these shores have witnessed. From the Battle of the Bay of St. Louis, Miss Claiborne lighting the first shot towards the advancing British, to Jean Lafitte the pirate and his connection with Andrew Jackson in the defense of the city of New Orleans. These shores, this city, they have seen quite a bit of history. The question to ask is, what history is yet to come?